Okay, welcome back. In this video, we will cover Chapter 8 in our anatomy series, uh, the integumentary system, the protective cover. Right, first, a quick introduction uh, to the system. Uh, the integumentary system is what uh, protects the internal workings of the body from the external environment. This is going to be a very protective layer, shielding the body from any harmful elements, you know, bacteria, viruses, uh, fungus, anything that can make you sick. In addition to other uh, vital functions uh, to your body. Now the skin is essential uh, to your well-being. It helps to regulate uh, body temperature. Also contains skin and the nails and various glands and the hair. So the, the integumentary system is not just the skin itself. It's everything found within that skin. It's the skin. It's the hair, the nails, uh, the glands, the hair. All that together collectively. That's the integumentary system. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, discuss the functions of the integumentary system, uh, list and describe the various layers of the skin, uh, to explain the healing process of the skin, uh, be able to describe the structure and the growth of hair and nails, explain how the body regulates temperature through the integumentary system, uh, of course describe some various skin diseases, uh, causative agents, and their related treatments. All right, overview of the system. Uh, like I mentioned a second ago, the integumentary system is the skin plus all its accessory components hair, nails, glands, and so on. The integument by itself is the another term for your skin, but the integumentary system is all of that all together. Now there are some uh, very vital functions that the system has. Of course to protect your body from uh, pathogens, anything that can make you sick. If they can't get inside your body then they can't make you sick. The system will help keep your body from drying out and also provides your body with a natural sunscreen. Some other vital functions, it will store uh, fatty tissue as a, as a storage site for energy. This will help produce uh, vitamin D along with help of the sun. This will provide sensory input, you know, detecting uh, pain or heat or cold or touch. It also helps to regulate the body temperature. Right, first off, we'll talk about the skin itself. This is the largest organ that we have. It will weigh approximately 20 pounds and it will cover about 20 square feet on a typical adult. If you were to cut a cross section of your skin, you'll find three distinct uh, uh, layers. You have the epidermis, which is the uppermost, the most superficial, uh, the dermis, and then the most internal layer, uh, the hypodermis, or the subcutaneous uh, fascia. Here's an illustration with all those layers indicated. Of course, you see the hair growing out of the skin here. The most superficial layer, the epidermis here. Just below that, the dermis, where you find the blood vessels and the hair roots and so on. And then just below that, the hypodermis. Remember, hypo means below, so below the dermis, or epidermis, above the dermis. All right, we'll start with the epidermis first. This is the layer of skin that we are able to see on the outside. And it's made up of multiple layers of stratified uh, squamous epithelial tissue. Now, this layer will be uh, avascular. There are no, no blood vessels in this layer. And it also has no nerve cells. The skin that we see on, on our surface by the point that we see it is become or has become very keratinized, very waterproof. The tissue is basically dead at that point to help give you a very protective coating on the outside of your body. Now the cells are constantly being uh, shed. The cells are constantly being made and then lost every day, all the time. Now, we talked about in a previous video when we talked about cell division. You know, some cells divide hardly ever, such as liver cells. They may divide you know, once a year, but the cells that within your uh, skin divide constantly all the time because they have to be replaced all the time. So the cells that are on your surface of your skin are fully replaced every two to four weeks. The outermost layer of the epidermis is uh, dead cells. And this layer is called a, a stratum corneum. These all these cells will be very flat, uh, very scaly, and filled with keratin or keratinized. And the body will slough off about 500 million cells every single day or about one and a half pounds of dead skin each year, allowing for a faster recovery time you know, in case of injuries. And of course, those are just approximations. Depending on what you're doing, you could be losing more or less skin. But on average, roughly 500 million cells every day are lost. All right, in this layer, you'll find uh, melanocytes. These are very specialized cells that produce skin pigment melanin. And this melanin is what gives you uh, your skin tone whether it be uh, a very light skin or very dark skin. And we all have the same number of 
uh, melanocytes. No matter what our background is, no matter what our ethnicity is, if we all have the same number of melanocytes approximately. What will vary is how active they are. You know, sometimes they'll, some people they will produce more melanin, other people they'll produce less. Now the variations in skin color are a result of a different amount of melanin that's produced and how it's uh, distributed throughout the body. Let's see, carotene this is what will give a yellowish hue to the skin. It's a, a pigment found in the skin. Albinism this is a light pigment in the skin, the hair, and the eyes. For people who, who suffer from albinoism, they will be very, very light in skin color. They'll be very, very fair skinned, and the, the colors of their eyes will be uh, red, for example, because of the lack of pigment. All right, next we'll talk about a pathology connection with uh, skin color and disease. Now, just by looking at someone's uh, skin color, you can tell or get some diagnostic feedback on if they are sick or not. A good example of that would be jaundice. When someone is jaundice, their skin appears to be yellowish in tint. The same thing with the, the, the white part of their eyes or their mucous membranes will appear to be yellowish. And that indicates a liver failure. The reason why this happens is the body can't excrete uh, the pigment bilirubin, which is a byproduct of breaking down old red blood cells. So this buildup of bilirubin gives the skin a yellowish hue to it. So this can be seen in whites of the eyes and also in the skin. But just by looking at someone you know, and their skin coloring, you can get an indication on whether or not they are sick. A bronze color could indicate adrenal gland disease. And what happens here is the adrenals, if they're malfunctioning, will produce excessive amounts of melanin. It's another way uh, the color of skin could indicate a disease. Uh, bruised skin could indicate you know, skin or blood or circulatory problems or even possible uh, physical abuse. You know, excessive bruising is not normal. You know, we all get bruises you know, from time to time, but bruising easily is an indicator that something else is going on. All right, now move on to the dermis. This is the layer below or just inferior to the epidermis. In this layer you'll find uh, the capillaries, you'll find our fibers with collagen and fibers with uh, elastin. you also find involuntary muscles here. And you also will find the nerve endings. Also in the uh, dermal layer you'll find uh, the lymphatic vessels that help transport lymph you know, throughout the body. Uh, you'll find the hair follicles and the hair roots. And also you'll find the sweat and the oil glands. The sweat glands are known as the sudoriferous glands, and the oil glands are known as the sebaceous glands. Also in this layer, layer you'll find uh, structures that are called dermal uh, papillae that will project toward the surface and will have anchor the dermis to the epidermal layer. And these are what your fingerprints really are. They are ridges, they are projections of the dermis. And also with the nerve fibers, this is what will allow you to sense what's going on in your environment. You know, are you receiving pressure or through touch? Is it light pressure? Is it you know, deep pressure? Is it hot? Is it cold? Those nerve fibers are found in the dermal layer. Okay, also in the dermis, you'll find the blood vessels. So when you blush, this is where the blood vessels are actually located in the dermis layer. Then you also will find the uh, fibers that are rich with collagen or uh, Elastin. It's what gives your skin its flexibility, and being able to be more flexible will prevent uh, tearing as the skin moves. So as we age, the uh, firmness of our skin will get less and less as we lose our elasticity, which is how we get wrinkles. The skin can't recoil back to its original shape, so it just kind of stays bent, and that's how you develop wrinkles. All right now, move on to uh, the sudoriferous glands, the sweat glands, and there are two different types of sweat glands. And depends on where they're found and what kind of product they secrete and whether or not if they smell or not. Uh, the first one are apocrine sweat glands. And these are found within uh, the groin, the anal region, and in the armpits. These become active around puberty and are believed by some people to be uh, a sexual attractant. This is the sweat that smells. So whenever you work out, you know, your armpits are going to stink because of the sweat and the products found within that sweat that are released in these regions. So apocrine will produce sweat that does have an odor. The other type is called eccrine. The eccrine glands are found in a much higher number throughout the body. You know, the forehead and your palms and your feet, uh, the upper lip, and these are important for regulating body temperature. And they will produce sweat with no odor. So whenever you have a workout, the sweat in your armpit will stink, the sweat on your forehead will not because they're different glands producing different uh, products within the sweat. See, on average, a body will have about 3 million sweat glands, and this could generate a loss of up to 500 milliliters per day. That's half a liter per day. 
Now sweat by itself has no odor, but what gives the odor from the apocrine sweat glands is how bacteria will degrade some of the products found within that sweat. All right, now moving on to uh, sebaceous glands. Uh, the sebaceous glands are the ones that will produce oil or sebum. Now the sebum is what keeps your skin from drying out because the, the skin is slightly acidic in nature and helps to de uh, destroy pathogens on the skin surface. Okay, here's a illustration of the, the three layers of the skin along with the locations of uh, various uh, sweat glands. The apocrine will be closer to here. It has a different shape than the eccrine sweat glands here. You see the sebaceous glands, the one that produce oil, will be attached or very nearby where a hair follicle is growing out. That's why your hair can become oily over time if you don't wash it. Because it's the buildup of the sebum or the oil produced from these glands. Now move on to the, uh, the innermost layer, the uh, hypodermis or the subcutaneous uh, fascia. In here you'll find, you find fatty tissue and fibrous connective tissue and elastic connective tissue. The uh, fat cells that are found in this layer, or the lipocytes, will produce fat that is needed to uh, pad and protect the more internal tissues of the body. And it really acts as an insulator to help regulate body temperature. And this layer, this fascia, will attach to the muscles of the body. All right, now move on to uh, our, another pathology connection. And this one we'll talk about herpes. Now, herpes is a lifelong viral infection that will produce uh, small uh, fluid-filled sacs called vesicles or blisters. And this is something that you don't ever get rid of. Once you have herpes, you have it forever. It may be dormant for decades at a time, but it's never ever gone away. So you'll have periods of uh, remission where it doesn't do anything, and then exacerbation when it does pop up, usually in times of stress. So it can pop up in times of stress or if you're compromised if your immune system is compromised in other ways, other, other diseases can lead to uh, this uh, exacerbation also. There are various types of herpes. Uh, the first one we'll talk about, herpes varicella, more commonly called chickenpox. This is spread by airborne particles or direct contact. You're dealing with someone who actually has chickenpox, so you'll, you'll be exposed to that uh, pathogen. You'll find the vesicles found on the face and on the trunk and on the uh, the arms usually, the extremities, and these vesicles are always associated with very intense itching. Another type, uh, herpes zoster, also known as shingles. This is the adult version of chickenpox. So if you've had chickenpox as a child, you're already exposed and already have that uh, virus dormant lying inside you. So if you are exposed to chickenpox again as an adult, it will most likely develop into shingles. Shingles is identified with uh, blisters or a rash and the blisters or the, the rashes that are associated with uh, shingles are found on the trunk and go toward the midline. They basically follow the path of a sensory neuron or from the peripheral uh, part of the body going toward the midline. Now these lesions can be extremely painful producing very sharp, very stabbing uh, pains. They may last from a week and a half to several weeks. And this is a result of stress, you know, disease, uh, trauma, aging is also another factor for developing shingles. Uh, herpes simplex 1, this causes uh, cold sores or fever blisters right around the nose or around the mouth. These will commonly develop after uh, you're getting over a cold or a fever. Herpes simplex 2, uh, this is what will cause genital herpes. This is spread by direct you know, sexual contact. In its active stage, it's very highly contagious and even can be spread during remission. Of course, it's mostly spread by sexual contact, but it's not limited to just sexual transmission. So any kind of direct contact with the regions can, can spread genital herpes. All right, here are some images. That's the first one, uh, shingles, blisters. They can be incredibly painful. Uh, cold sores around the mouth. All right, now we'll talk about another a pathology connection, uh, warts or verrucosa, caused by the papilloma virus. The common warts, uh, these are what are found on children's hands, uh, children's fingers, uh, spread by scratching or direct contact with these warts, and usually will disappear you know, often on their own. 
another type of horse you have plantar horse plantar is a reference to the sole or the bottom of the foot so they're found on the bottom of the foot these tend to grow inward inside the foot and you'll see a very smooth surface but as you walk you're putting more and more pressure on these on these warts who can be very painful and some common treatments to get rid of these either having surgery to, you know, to remove them or actually freezing them off all right here's an example of a plantar wart on this person's uh, big toe right about here That's some common warts on the finger here the genital warts these would be mainly sexually transmitted very highly contagious even when you are in remission you are still able to spread these uh, pathogens there's a very strong connection between genital warts and the prominence of cervical cancer and this leads to the controversy of should we require teenage girls to be uh, vaccinated with the uh, papilloma virus to prevent cervical cancer some people are for it some people are against it tinea tinea this is a generic term for any kind of fungal skin infections this will usually occur in warm uh, moist regions of the body and some common signs cracking uh, itching uh, weeping of the skin a very common type of this type of uh, fungal infection athlete's foot or tinea pettis you know, pettis is a reference to the foot so it's spread by direct contact with uh, a contaminated surface such as a, a shower in a locker room these will usually develop in in between the spaces of the toes so that's why for many people whether you be an athlete or just someone who goes to a gym if you work out and then want to take a shower there you want to wear shower shoes or something where your feet are not in direct contact with the the shower floor because it's used by so many people you don't know who's been there and what they may have on their feet so you're better off wearing a type of sandal or a shower shoe this is another example of this type of fungal skin infection uh, tinea cruis which is another term for jock itch this will infect the groin or the scrotum of the male this will be aggravated by the more and more perspiration uh, increased physical activity and then underwear or shorts that are too tight because this will cause uh, more heat more moisture to build up which will cause the fungus to grow Atenea caporis or ringworm is a fungal infection on the smooth skin of the arms or on the body or on the legs what gives this away is a red ring shaped structure with a very pale center in the middle and even though it's called ringworm there's no worm involved at all that's just the name uh, another kind tinea inguium is a fungal infection just under the fingernails or the toenails if left untreated the nail can become overgrown and become thickened and become uh, white or brittle in appearance All right, here's some uh, images first athlete's foot you can see it up here some in between toes and on here on the bottom a tinea inguium the fingernail fungus or toenail fungus here uh, ringworm the circles with the pale center all right those are all fungal infections now we'll move on to uh, bacterial infections uh, cellulitis is a inflammatory condition of the skin and of the subcutaneous tissue in general this can produce uh, red uh, swollen very painful areas and often caused by the uh, bacterium staphylococcus uh, the source of these infections will usually be a, a bed sore or an ulcer or a wound that's been untreated and if left untreated for too long this can lead to a very life-threatening situation such as endocarditis or being or septicemia All right, Lyme disease is a bacterial infection that's spread by a deer tick bite uh, some common signs of Lyme disease uh, general malaise uh, flu-like symptom or joint inflammation uh, you also have you also will have fever or chills and a rash it looks like a a red circle with a lighter center resembling a bullseye or a target logo this will appear a few days after or even a few weeks after the initial tick bite okay, if left untreated this can lead to neurological conditions uh, cardiovascular complications uh, even arthritis and the way you diagnose uh, Lyme disease is by doing a blood test to confirm the actual infection and here's how this would present itself a bullseye appearance in the larger red ring here with a bullseye here in the middle as a a dead giveaway that there's a Lyme disease infection going on and here's the, the actual tick that would cause 
Lyme disease, or that would spread Lyme disease. All right, now move on to how skin heals. Now, many common, ordinary, everyday items can damage your skin. Now, if skin is punctured and wound damages blood vessels, obviously the wound will fill with blood. Now, within the blood, there are multiple factors that will cause clotting. The, uh, the top part of the clot exposed to the air is what hardens and what forms the scab that we see, the, the, your natural bandage. And this scab will form a barrier that will prevent other pathogens from entering uh, this open wound. All right, after this step, you have uh, an inflammatory response occurs. This will cause the, a series of uh, white blood cells to migrate to the area that has been damaged to destroy any pathogens that are still there or that may have entered through the wound. At the same time this is going on, you have a different kind of cell called a fibroblast will arrive at this injured site and will start to pull the edges of the wound together so the skin can grow back together. And then the basal layer of the epidermis will begin to hyperproduce new cells in order to uh, speed up the recovery process. Now, if the wound is uh, severe, a scar composed of new collagen fibers will form. And scars don't contain any accessory organs or any sense of feeling. They're just you know, scar tissue. And some treatments like uh, adhe adhesive strips or specialized glue uh, on skin or stitches can help to minimize scarring. Now, ideally, you know, in a perfect situation, the wound will start to heal from the inside and outward. So aids in preventing uh, pathogens from becoming trapped between the healed surface and also the deeper layers of the skin. Uh, this will aid in preventing the pathogens from becoming trapped between the, uh, the healed surface and the layers of the tissue below it, where this could develop into a pocket of infection. So here's an example of how this would work. We have the injury here. The part has been kind of ripped out. You have a blood clot that forms here. You have fibroblasts that will migrate to the area and will help to overproduce cells that will help join that end to that end, forming this bridge. You also have large numbers of white blood cells migrating to this area to eliminate any other pathogens that may still be there. All right, now we'll move on to a pathology connection and we'll talk about burns. Now burns can be caused by radiation or electricity or heat or chemicals. And there are two factors that are used to assess how severe the damage is. Uh, the depth of the burn and the size of the area that is damaged. Now the depth of the burn is reference to what layer or layers of the skin is affected by the burn. Either first, second, third, or even fourth degree in burns. First degree burns, these are called uh, partial thickness burns, only damage the epidermis. So first degrees only affect one layer. That's a good way to make the make the connection. Uh, symptoms: redness, pain, uh, but no blistering. That's a key factor. No blistering. The pain will usually go away in two or three days. Uh, no scarring, and the complete healing will take about a week or so. Most sunburns fall under this category. If you were to grab something hot off a stove, and without really without realizing that it's hot, when you re when you pull your hand away, you have may have a slight burn on your hand. That technically is a first degree burn. But the key factor here is no blisters. A second degree burn will involve all of the epidermis and part of the dermis. So you're now involving two layers. So second degree and two layers of the skin. Uh, common symptoms, uh, pain, redness, and uh, blistering. So blistering is a good indicator of uh, second degree burn or worse. Now the extent of the blisters will depend on how deep the burn actually went. And these blisters will actually will continue to get larger after the initial exposure to the burn as they fill with more and more fluid. Now the blisters will heal in about a uh, week and a half to about two weeks if there are no complications. Now the deeper that these burns go into the dermis, this could affect the healing time. So it could be, instead of up to two weeks, could be up to 14 weeks to heal. And scarring is fairly common for second degree burns. The third degree burns, these are uh, called full thickness burns. They will in fact impact all the epidermis, all the dermis, and all the hypodermis. All three layers of the skin are affected. The surface of the skin will have a very leathery feel. Uh, it will vary in color. Instead of being red because of a burn, it will be tan or brown or black or white, it's depending on the severity of the burn. Often the patient will feel no pain, even though this is a very severe injury, because the 
nerve receptors have been destroyed by the severity of the burn. So you can't feel something if the receptor is damaged. The other factors that are, or other components that are destroyed, and something the serious, uh, the sweat glands are destroyed and the sebaceous glands are destroyed. Uh, hair follicles, uh, blood vessels, so everything that's found within the three layers of the skin is now completely destroyed and non-functional. So you will need skin grafting uh, to be ordered to heal, and this can be very life-threatening, depending on how widespread the third degree burn is. Now fourth degree burns will go all the way down to the bone of the patient. So all three layers of the skin uh, plus down to the bone. These will destroy uh, muscles and tendons. Just like third degree you'll feel no pain because the pain receptors are uh, destroyed during this injury. And these kind of burns on your arms or legs may require an amputation at that area and below it because there's no way, no way that the skin can heal enough to be productive. The only way to really start the healing process is to eliminate the damaged area. The way the percentage of a burn is calculated is something called the rule of nines. The body is divided into uh, various regions and each region is given a percentage based on the surface area value. So for example, the head and neck represents 9%. Each upper limb is 9%. Each lower limb is 18%. So that's a factor of 9. Uh, the front of your trunk is 18%. The back of the trunk and the buttocks is another 18%. And the only one that's not a factor of 9 is the, the perineum, the anus and the urogenital region. That's only 1%. So that's how you're quickly able to calculate if someone was burned 35% you know, of the body, 45% of the body, 20% of their body, all based on this rule of nines. All right, here's the illustration. Uh, we'll start here on the bottom, with the degrees of burns. Uh, the first one, a first degree burn, you know, a superficial or a partial thickness, only the epidermis gets damaged. For second degree, all the epidermis and some of the dermis, you get a more widespread area affected and you'll see blistering up here. Third degree, you actually will get charring because you're impacting all three layers of the skin, so epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. And often it will feel no pain because the nerve receptors are, are, are destroyed at this point. And then fourth degree, even though it's not listed on here, will go all the way down to the bone. An image up here, uh, the rule of nines. So the head and neck, 9%. Head, front of the trunk, 9%. Back, 9%. Uh, abdomen, uh, front and back, nine each. Arms, four and a half each. And of course, the urogenital area, the groin, 1%. Right, here are some images of various degrees of burns. First degree burns looks like a, it's a typical sunburn based on how it's laid out here. Over here, a third degree burn. It, you can actually see the charring, the, the black parts here. And the clinical concerns for uh, patients with burns relate to how the skin functions, especially with a bacterial infection or with the the fluid loss and the heat loss. Now, patients with a third degree burn must receive very prompt medical treatment. Now, severe burns will require healing at an intensity that your body just can't do on its own. You have to be put in a special location to help speed that process along. And the damaged skin must be removed as quickly as possible to allow for skin grafting to be uh, completed. Now when it comes to skin grafting, it can come from uh, multiple sources. The first one, auto grafting, is using the patient's own skin. That's where the auto part comes in, so automatically. It's coming from the same person, just from a different location on their body. Or the source can be uh, from a, a different person, hetero grafting. Now the process of grafting actually requires uh, multiple surgeries because large areas that have been damaged can't be done all at once. You have to do it bit by bit by bit. And it's common for uh, some skin grafts to not be effective and not take to the patient. There are some other options, uh, such as including or including growing the sheets of skin in the lab from the patient's own cells and then applying it to the affected area later on. All right, now we move on to another accessory structure of the skin, uh, the nails. Now these are specialized epithelial cells that originate from nail root 
that give rise to the nails themselves. As the cells grow out and over the nail bed, they become filled with keratin, or become keratinized, uh, forming something that looks like a, a horn on a bull. Uh, the cuticle is a fold of tissue that covers the nail root itself. And the portion of the nail that we see, the fingertips and then our tips of our toes, is the nail body. And these nails will typically grow about one millimeter each week. Now the pink color of the nail comes from the, the vascularization of the tissue just underneath the nails. And you'll often see a, a half moon shaped area called the lunula that's going to be a little bit thicker than the cells that are around the base. Okay, so if you look at the general structures of a, of a nail, the part that we see, the nail bed, or the, the free edge up here, the lunula, the half moon shape here, and the cuticle here. Moving on to uh, the hair. Uh, body hair is normal and it, is, it does have a very important function. It helps to regulate body temperature and also serves as a sensor to detect when things are on your body, such as you know, bugs or a cobweb or something. You may not be able to see it, but you can feel it there. The eyelashes are a good example of um, hair with an important function. They prevent material from entering the eyes. Same thing with the the hairs in your nose. They prevent larger articles or larger objects from trying to enter the lungs. Now the hair is composed of a fibrous protein called keratin. And the hair that you see externally is called the uh, the shaft with the root at the end. Now the shaft is covered by a protective layer of uh, flat cells called the cuticle. And below that cuticle layer you have the cortex layer. Each hair has a root that extends down into the dermis onto the or down to the follicle. Now the follicle is formed by epithelial cells with a very rich source of blood provided by the uh, vessels of the dermis layer. Now cells will divide and grow at the base of the follicle. And older cells are crowded out and then eventually will die. So the shaft of the hair that you see is comprised of dead cells that have been pushed out further and further and further from the growing cells at the base of the follicle. Now a common misconception is if you shave that causes the hair to grow back faster and that's not the case. Now, cutting your hair or shaving does not impact how often your hair grows. What does happen with the shaving when you are shaving with a razor the shaft of hair normally is a cylinder shaped but when you shave you're cutting it down into a point so when a hair grows back you feel the point and poking through the skin sooner because it is a sharper edge as opposed to a, a rounded edge of a of a typical hair shaft. So it may feel like it's growing back you know, more quickly but it's not. You are just feeling the point of the shaft as opposed to a more rounded smoother edge than normal hair would be. Now the spacious glands associated with the hair will secrete the sebum that helps to coat the hair follicle. As, and this will work its way down to the skin surface to help to waterproof and lubricate the skin and hair, aid in the decreasing uh, infections. Now sebum uh, production does decrease as we get older, which is why older people will have uh, drier skin usually or more brittle hair because the oil that was produced when they were young just isn't being made as much anymore. The image we saw earlier, the sebaceous glands here, they're producing the oil here to help to waterproof and protect the follicle and then the skin. So you'll have the cells actually actively dividing here. So as the shaft grows out, out through the epidermis and goes outward, these are filled with dead keratinized cells that have been pushed out by the dividing cells here. Now your hair color is dependent on the amount and the different kinds of melanin that you produce. The more melanin that you have, the darker your hair color will be, your natural hair color will be. Now, lighter colored hair, like white hair, will occur in the absence of melanin. Uh, red hair, for example, is a result of hair that has melanin with iron added to it. Flat hair shafts will produce hair that is curly in nature, and round hair shafts will produce straight hair. Uh, the term alopecia this is a term for any type of hair loss that could be you know, chronic or could be acute. Uh, some forms, such as you know, male pattern baldness, it's not a really a disease, but it is an indicator of an inherited trait. You can also have hair loss from certain treatments, such as chemotherapy. It's common for uh, 
cancer patients who undergo chemotherapy to lose their hair. If you have a hormonal imbalance or other infections or severe emotional or physical stress or even some side effects of certain medications, all these can lead to acute loss of hair. All right, now move on to another pathology connection. And for here, we'll talk about lice. Now, lice are tiny insect parasites. And lice will be spread by direct contact with other infected people or infested objects, such as a hat or a, a pillowcase or a, a bed sheet and so on. Or anyone can become infested with lice. Right, there are different types of lice, depending on what region of the body uh, they are infecting or they are infesting. The first one, head lice. Very, very common. This is often checked for in, in schools. Body lice. This is a result of poor personal hygiene and can also carry disease. And the last type, uh, pubic lice. This is spread through sexual contact, uh, more commonly called uh, crabs. But they are actually a type of lice. The treatments uh, to, to combat lice, uh, bathing or shampooing with a, a very medicated type of shampoo. And this shampoo will eliminate the lice and also the eggs. Once you destroy the eggs, there's no new lice to be produced. A very thorough cleaning of all bedding, any kind of hat, any kind of comb, hairbrushes, anything that came in contact with that infested area must be thoroughly cleaned or just gotten rid of. The next one, we'll talk about scabies. Scabies is a type of mite that will burrow into the skin where it lays its eggs. Now these are transmitted through direct contact with an infected individual. Now mites will usually lodge themselves within the folds of the skin, such as the underarms or the groin or under uh, the breast or in the wrist. And some common symptoms, vesicles, uh, pustules, uh, intense itching. Now without treatment, uh, there's a certain life cycle that will develop with scabies. Uh, first you have the eggs laid underneath the skin. Uh, these eggs will hatch within three to five days. The young will mature on top of the skin surface in about two or three weeks. And then these mites will mate and start the whole process all over again. And the way you treat scabies is with a, a special formulated uh, cream that is applied to the skin. All right, here's a, a picture of a rash that's caused by uh, canine scabies. You can see the various pustules all throughout the chest and abdomen. All right, now I'll move on to temperature regulation. Now your integumentary system has a vital role with regulating your body's temperature. And the way your system does this is due to the size of the blood vessels. They can either be made larger or made smaller. When they're made larger, that's called vasodilation. Vaso is reference to vessels. So you are dilating the blood vessels. And this will occur when the body is attempting to get more blood exposed to a cooler environment. And the opposite of that will be vasoconstriction, to force blood away from the skin and back toward the core. So whenever you are uh, upset or when you're angry or when you're blushing, the reason why your face becomes more red is because the blood vessels are dilating in your face. So more blood is going to your face. That's why you feel hot also. But when there's vasoconstriction, that blood is shunted away from the skin to be directed toward more important vital organs. It's the other way is that your integumentary system helps to regulate temperature. Uh, your sweat glands will secrete water and nitrogenous waste to help cool you down. So as long as you stay hydrated and are able to produce sweat, your natural thirst indicator will indicate how well hydrated you are. And the risk of dehydration can be serious. So whenever you are, whenever you feel thirsty, you are already dehydrated at that point. The temperature regulation is also aided by the hairs on top of the skin. Uh, various muscles within the skin called erector pili are attached to the hairs. Whenever you get a cold chill, when, you're, you, get, when you get goosebumps when the hair stands up, it's, they're being pulled up by these erector pili muscles. And they're doing that to reach up to higher temperatures or to warmer air. Alright, here's a good side-by-side -side comparison depending on if you're in cold weather or in warm weather. So if you're in cold weather, like this person is skiing, the blood vessels will constrict. So this will decrease the radiant heat that your body will be losing. So the sweat glands will become less active and muscles will shiver because shivering muscles help to generate heat and help keep you warm. So when you're in a situation like this, Blood is much more needed at your heart and lungs and liver and internal organs, not your fingertips or not your toes. So you'll have vasoconstriction here to direct blood more toward the trunk. 
The opposite of that, at increased temperature, the blood vessels will dilate, causing more heat to be lost. The sweat glands will become much more active, because when you get hot, you need to cool yourself down. So the way your body does that is to, or is through sweat. All right, now we'll move on to another pathology connection. We'll talk about various types of skin lesions. These are pathologically altered pieces of tissue. And there are many kinds. It depends on what their overall size is, what their overall shape is, and whether or not they are solid or not. The first one, macule, is a discolored spot on the skin, basically a, another term for a freckle is a macule. A wheel is a localized elevation of skin, often uh, goes along with itching. A papule is a solid elevated area of skin, such as a pimple. A nodule is a larger papule, so acne vulgaris, so a, a large pimple. A vesicle is a small sac that's filled with fluid, like a blister. You can have a, a, a bula, which is a large vesicle, such as a chicken pox. A pustule is a lesion that's filled with pus, such as a whitehead. Another type of lesion, you can have an ulcer. This is an erosion, or the eating or gnawing away of a tissue. And you also have a crust, which is a dry, brownish, yellowish, serous exudation. Right, another kind of lesion you can have is called a scale. It's a thin, uh, dry flack of uh, cornified epithelial cells. Think of a scale on a fish, for example. And lastly, you can have a fissure. It's a crack-like sore or a slit that extends through the epidermis into the dermis, such as an athlete's foot. Now here are some illustrations of the different types of lesions we just talked about. Uh, the first one, macule, another term for a freckle, you know, a discolored spot on the skin. Uh, pustule, you know, a small elevated area filled with pus, like a whitehead. Wheel, uh, localized elevation, often accompanied with uh, itching. All right, here's an illustration of an ulcer or an erosion. You know, the eating away or the gnawing away of a tissue, such as in a, a decubitus ulcer, which is also another term for a bed sore. A papule, you know, a solid elevated area of the skin, such as a pimple. Uh, crust, you know, the dry, uh, serous or brown or yellowish uh, exudation as seen with some other lesions like uh, eczema. Nodule, uh, a larger uh, pimple, such as acne vulgaris. Scale, you know, the thin, uh, dry flakes of, of epithelial tissue, like in psoriasis, for example. And vesicle, a small fluid-filled sac. Uh, a larger example of this would be a, a, a bula, like you would find in chicken pox. And a fissure, a crack-like sore or slit that goes all the way through the epidermis down to the dermal layer, like you would find with an uh, athlete's foot. All right, now we'll move on to various diseases of the integumentary system. First one, abrasion. And etiology is a mechanical removal of the skin. Uh, some signs and symptoms, loss of skin surface, uh, redness, swelling, inflammation, diagnostic test, visual examination, uh, treatment, proper cleansing techniques, uh, removal of any foreign matter, uh, antiseptics, a bandage necessary, and abrasion is another term for a scratch. So a scratching is a mechanical removal of your skin. The acne, uh, the etiology is a metabolic condition, uh, allergies or various drugs or endocrine disorders are possible causative agents. Uh, some signs, uh, inflammation of hair follicles or sebaceous glands, especially on the face or the neck, the upper back, and shoulders, and chest, can form uh, blackheads and then cysts and then nodules, uh, pustules, and then pimples. The diagnostic test obviously would be a visual exam. Uh, treatment uh, for mild cases of acne, you know, proper you know, cleansing techniques, and some over-the-counter medications. If there are if it's a severe case, uh, you may need uh, prescribed medications, uh, antibiotics, uh, steroids, uh, basal cell carcinoma, uh, etiology. This is a, a new growth or malignant uh, tumor. This is an, an example of cancer. Uh, signs of this, uh, small, shiny, uh, or papules. These will enlarge to form a whitish border around a central depression of an ulcer, and the ulcer may be bleeding. A uh, best way to check for this Diagnostically, would be a biopsy, and the treatment of this, a surgical removal, or possibly radiation, or even a cryosurgery. The cubitus ulcer, also known as a bed sore or a pressure ulcer. Uh, the etiology, this is a tissue injury due to a unrelieved pressure placed on a specific area, 
So if someone is uh, bedridden or comatose, or if, if you just lay in one position for too long and you don't relieve that pressure, ulcers will start to develop. And the skin will basically just be eaten away at a pressure point. So even if someone is unresponsive in a coma or bedridden, they should be moved and rotated every few hours to prevent bed sores from developing because you are relieving pressure on certain pressure points. Some signs and symptoms, red inflamed uh, crater-like regions that are located usually around a bony prominence, such as the hips, for example. Uh, diagnostic test, uh, visual inspection, and uh, culturing to check for the uh, site of infection uh, treatment. The uh, best way to treat for these is our, our preventative measures, such as turning, uh, padding, and then treating the infection of a sore. Uh, boils or furuncles. Aology, these are caused by staphylococcus bacteria. Some common signs, inflammation, uh, localized uh, pus field lesions, uh, a painful affected area. Carbuncles are large abscesses composed of several of these boils. Some diagnostic testing, a visual exam, and also taking a culture of the site. Uh, treatment, uh, proper antiseptic uh, cleansing techniques, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, using uh, warm, moist heat. And depending on how severe these are, you may you may need to uh, drain these these areas. Thermal burns, the etiology, you know, heat or radiation, uh, varying intensities and varying uh, duration. Uh, some signs and symptoms will depend on how severe the burns are. The color may be different depending on if it's first, second, or third degree. Is it red or is it all the way up to black or white depending on the charring? Uh, diagnostic test, the visual exam, and of course treatment will depend greatly on how severe the burns are. There's a large variety of treatments depending on the severity of the burn. Uh, cellulitis, etiology caused by the streptococcus and staphylococcus bacteria. Uh, some signs and symptoms, inflammation of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, tissue is swollen and red and painful. Some diagnostic tests, some visual exams, and also the culture of the site. Some common treatments, antibiotics, whether it be oral or intravenous, depending on how severe the exposure is. A contusion, or another word for a bruise. Etiology, due to blunt force or some form of skin injury without the skin surface breaking. Some signs and symptoms, swelling, pain, discoloration. Diagnostic testing, a visual inspection, uh, imaging to see if there's any more uh, of a severe injury underneath. Uh, treatment, cold applications, uh, a firm bandage to impede any kind of swelling. Uh, elevation, uh, if possible, uh, heat application, also massage, all these can help bruising. Uh, dermatitis, or contact dermatitis. Uh, etiology is a contact with an allergen. It's going to be you know, soaps or cosmetics or metals or plastics or drugs or so uh, Some signs and symptoms, uh, small reddish lesions, to, to anywhere to larger vesicles, uh, weepy or crusty areas, itching as possible. Uh, diagnostic test, a uh, visual exam, uh, treatments. The avoidance of anything that's causing you know, this uh, infection to occur, and if needed, medication to decrease the inflammatory response. Eczema, uh, etiology is a genetic predisposition to allergies. So in, in infants, it may include rashes to milk products or dairy products or other foods or, or stress. Uh, some signs and symptoms: uh, skin inflammation, redness, uh, scales, pustules, crusting. Uh, diagnostic test, visual exam, and also a personal history. A treatment, there's no true cure for eczema, but you can treat the symptoms. You can eliminate the you know, offending food or reducing the stress or using a, a topical a corticosteroidal cream or skin moisturizers or the use of antihistamines. But there's no way to cure it, but you can manage the symptoms. Folliculitis, etiology, this is a, a bacterial infection usually caused by the staphylococcus bacteria. Uh, signs of this, small pustules that form around the base of a hair follicle. Uh, some diagnostic testing, uh, of course a visual exam, and the culture of the site. And some proper treatment, you know, daily cleansing with uh, antiseptic cleanser, uh, oral antibiotics. And those would be used for a chronic condition or a, a severe case of this. Herpes, uh, etiology, is from the herpes family of viruses. It depends on which exact type or which individual type of a virus you're talking about. Uh, some signs, uh, clusters of fluid-filled vesicles in various patterns, depending on what 
specific uh, condition. Uh, skin inflammation, rash, uh, pain involving the peripheral nerves. This could easily remain dormant for decades until you are under high stress and or immunosuppressed. Uh, diagnostic test, visual exam, uh, site culture, and the treatment, uh, antiviral, or a good form of treatment, and these are usually uh, self-limiting. Hives, uh, etiology of these, uh, this is an allergic reaction to external agents such as bee stings, plants, uh, temperature extremes, sunlight, or some internal agents like food or food additives, uh, medications, or certain disease conditions. Uh, some signs and symptoms, uh, itchy wheels that are surrounded by a red inflamed area and can cover most of the body. A diagnostic test, a visual exam, also a patient history, and some treatments. Obviously, avoid the, the source of the, uh, the allergen, and also taking antihistamines to help lower the inflammation response. Uh, keloid, or the etiology of these is tissue trauma or surgical incision. Uh, some common signs of these, this is an overproduction of collagen during tissue repair, often creating a much larger structure than the area that originally was damaged or scarred. So you really have an overgrowth of, of collagen. A diagnostic test is a visual inspection. Uh, for treatments, uh, surgical removal of this excess collagen filled tissue. But this will always lead to the greater potential of the keloid to grow back. An example of a, a keloid here. An example of one keloid here. Lyme disease, etiology, a tick bite containing a very specific uh, spiral ketal form of bacterium. Uh, signs and symptoms, a bullseye, uh, appearance of a macule or a papule at the site of the tick bite. Uh, Flu-like symptoms, a stiff neck or swollen lymph nodes, uh, aching joints, fever, headache, uh, a very persistent sore throat, a dry cough, uh, possible neurologic conditions if left untreated. It's a diagnostic test, a visual exam, uh, patient history, also blood tests, and some treatments for this uh, disease. Uh, vaccines, antibiotics, Tr you treat the secondary conditions that arise from the initial exposure, and the repeat infection is a possibility. Malignant melanoma, the etiology, this is, occurs in melanocytes due to an ex excessive exposure to sunlight. Some signs and symptoms, having a brown or a black irregular patch that appears suddenly on the skin. It can have a color or size change in a pre-existing wart or mole. Is also a good indicator of uh, malignant melanoma. And this can metastasize to other areas pretty quickly. The key diagnostic test for, for this is a biopsy. And then for proper treatment, the surgical removal of not only the melanoma, but the, around, the surrounding tissue, and also uh, chemotherapy. So the next one, lice, or pediculosis. Uh, etiology, obviously lice infection, infestation. Uh, signs and symptoms, lice and its egg deposits are also called nits. Best way to diagnose this is a, a visual inspection and a proper treatment, proper cleansing uh, techniques uh, with a medicated uh, shampoo or medicated soaps, uh, either rem the removal of or the proper cleaning of anything that came in contact with the lice, such as hats or or bedding or towels or combs or hairbrushes. So it needs to be either very thoroughly cleaned or just thrown away. Psoriasis. Uh, etiology this is a possible genetic basis with attacks that are triggered by emotional stress or illness or skin damage or sunlight. Some common signs, uh, red colored skin with a silvery uh, patches around it. This is a rapid replacement of the epidermis layer of cells. Uh, dry cracking skin with uh, some crusting on the edges. This can be painful. Uh, you can have periods where this will go into remission and be exacerbated later on. And there may be a arthritic component to this condition also. Some diagnostic tests, uh, visual exam, and also a patient history. Uh, some treatments, uh, skin applications to deal with you know, some of the symptoms. Uh, certain medications can work. Uh, steroids and also ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. Uh, scabies, etiology here would be mites. Uh, the signs and symptoms, an elevated uh, grayish to white lines or burrows, vesicle and pustule formation you know, due to the bite or the feces or the the eggs of the offending mite, and an intense itching. Diagnostic test, obviously a visual inspection, 
and for treatments, uh, a proper cleaning technique, uh, application of a medicated cream, and all infected individuals must be treated to prevent reinfection. Right, next one, uh, seborrheic uh, keratosis. Etiology, this is an unknown agent or agents that are causing benign overgrowth of epithelial cells. Uh, some signs and symptoms, a well-defined warty scaled lesion that can present in a variety of colors, anywhere from a yellowish color to a brownish color. A diagnostic test, uh, a visual inspection or a lab examination. And the proper treatment of this is a the scraping away of the area or the freezing away of the area. A squamous carcinoma, uh, etiology is abnormal cell growth arising from the epidermis that occurs most often on the lower lip and then on the scalp. Uh, some common signs and symptoms, abnormal appearance of the skin, such as an ulcer or a pimple or a mole. Some common diagnostic test would be a biopsy. And for treatment, the, uh, using radiation or the uh, surgical removal of the area. Uh, the various types of uh, tinea, these are you know, fungal infections. Uh, tinea uh, barbe, barber's itch. Uh, tinea capitis on the scalp. Uh, tinea corporis, ringworm. Uh, tinea crurus, jock itch. Uh, tinea pettis, athlete's foot. And tinea uh, inguium uh, under the nails, such as fingernails and toenails. All these are fungal infections. All right, some common signs and symptoms. It will depend on what individual type of case you're talking about. It could be a red ring shaped patches. It could be red inflamed skin. It could be uh, cracked areas. It could be itchiness. It could be uh, discoloration of affected nails. Some diagnostic testing, a visual exam, uh, microscopic examination, and also a, a site culture. Uh, common treatments for all of these uh, fungal infections, maintaining a clean, dry condition of the infected area and using antifungal medications, either they, either they be systemic or topical. Warts, whether they be common or plantar or genital. Uh, etiology for all these is the same. They are caused by viruses. Uh, signs and symptoms, a raised rubbery scaly growth of a variety of different sizes and different colors. A diagnostic test, a visual examination. And for the treatment, either a, a chemical removal or the physical removal of these lesions. Here's an example of, of hives. Here's an example of uh, malignant melanoma. Here's an example of uh, acne. Here's an example of poison ivy, which is an example of uh, dermatitis. All right. Here's an example of uh, herpes simplex. All right. An example of a second degree burn on this patient's feet and legs. You can see the fairly large blisters here, 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 even on the bottom of the feet. And the blistering is a good indicator that it's second degree, at least. Now move on to our pharmacology corner. Talk about the transdermal patches. These are placed on the skin in the morning and left in place for 24 hours or more. And these will allow for medications to be slowly absorbed over an extended amount of time. Right, probably the most well-known example of a transdermal patch is it's for breaking the addiction to smoking. So using for nicotine. So your body is slowly exposed to another source of nicotine so you don't have to so you don't feel the urge to smoke a cigarette. Uh, nitroglycerin uh, patches are for heart conditions and also birth control. Uh, some uh, topical creams, these are used for skin irritations. The mild creams can or are used to stop itching. And the more powerful creams contain uh, corticosteroids, which will provide anti-inflammatory relief, but without the systemic effects that are often go along with steroids in general. Antifungal uh, topical creams, these are used to help to treat diseases such as ringworm or athlete's foot. See, uh, medicated shampoos, these are useful in treating uh, dandruff and lice. Other examples of topical creams, uh, antivirals, these are used to treat uh, herpes and other viral skin conditions. Uh, antibiotics, they used to treat uh, bacterial infections. Also prophylactic treatments of cuts to prevent any kind of opportunistic infections. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter number eight on the Tegumary system. We will continue our anatomy course with our next video on chapter number nine.